This morning I had intended to preach a sermon, notice the emphasis on the word intended, called Crossing Jordan. But as I thought about where we are in the history of this world, and as I thought about the coming of Jesus, God's Spirit directed me to a different topic entitled, First Things First. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word this morning, I pray thee that your spirit would move among us. We've talked about outreach. We've talked about soul winning. We've talked about evangelism. We've talked about the finishing of your work in the world. But Lord, there's a work to be done in the church, a work to be done in our hearts, a work to be done deep within us. And so may this worship hour lead us to a deeper heart conversion and a deeper knowledge of you. We pray thee in Christ's name. Amen. The story is told of a woman who frantically called her insurance agent. And she said, Sir, I need to increase the insurance coverage on my house. He said, well, madam, come down to the office this week. We can sign the appropriate documents, and we'll make it happen. She said, sir, you don't understand. I need to increase the insurance coverage now. This is urgent. He repeated, madam, there are some documents that need to be signed, but can't I do it over the phone? Madam, I'll come out to your house tomorrow. Sir, you don't understand. My house is on fire. I need to increase the coverage now. There are some things you can put off in life until tomorrow. There are other things that have to be done today or else they have catastrophic consequences. There are some things that matter little if we put off in life and other things we put off until our eternal loss. Now, preparation for the second coming of Christ is one of those things. The second coming of Christ may be delayed, but our preparation for the coming of Christ should never be delayed. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus gives us the signs of His coming. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about preparation for His coming. In Matthew chapter 24, we have the events in the world. In Matthew chapter 25, we have the condition of the church. In Matthew chapter 24, we have what happens out there. In Matthew chapter 25, we have what happens in here. Now, you recall after Jesus talks about wars and rumors of wars, about famines and pestilences and earthquakes, after he talks about fires and floods and natural disasters, after he discusses those more than 25 signs of his coming, you come to the end of Matthew chapter 24, and Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 42, and if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to take it as we study the Word of God. Matthew chapter 24, and we're looking there at verse 42. And Jesus there in Matthew 24 says, watch therefore. He's talked about the signs of his coming, the signs in the social world, the political world, the economic world, the religious world. And Jesus says, watch therefore, verse 42, Matthew 24, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. So Jesus encourages the church to watch. In Matthew chapter 25, you have three parables. The parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, and the parable of the sheep and the goats. Those parables expand what it means to watch and be prepared for Christ's coming. Whereas Matthew chapter 24 gives you those broad strokes of the signs in the world, Jesus says those things are going to happen out there. But what is significant is preparation for my return. And so Matthew chapter 25 sets forth the first parable that talks about preparation for the return of our Lord. In Matthew's gospel, 
there are 21 parables. 14 of those 21 are kingdom of God parables. They are parables that specifically address the nature of the spiritual condition within the church. Now, the reason Matthew chapter 25 is so significant is Matthew chapter 25 describes the spiritual condition of the church awaiting the second coming of Christ. We begin with Matthew chapter 25 and looking at verse 1. But before we look at that word by word and study this parable verse by verse, I am directed to a statement in the writings of Ellen White. In the Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, she said this, I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. So heaven thinks that the parable of the ten virgins is so important, that it is so significant, that it's so vital for the church today, that God brought it to the end time prophet's mind again and again and again and again. This is present truth for this hour. This is a message for an end time people. This is not something at the fringes. This is at the core, at the heart of preparation for the coming of Jesus. And I pray today that the Spirit of God would come down on this ASI audience. I pray today that we would sense anew a message of present truth for this hour to prepare an end time people for the coming of Jesus. This is no time for fooling around. This is no time at dabbling with religiosity and spirituality. God is calling us today to an end time preparation. Matthew chapter 25. We begin there in verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven. Now, all kingdom of heaven parables refer to the church. Every time you see a kingdom of heaven parable, Christ is addressing the church. Verse 1, Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins. Why ten? Why not seven? Perfection. Why not 12, completeness? Why not four, universality? Why not three, 10? 10 was a significant number in Judaism. 10 was the smallest number of Jewish men that could compose a synagogue and establish it. So the number 10 is a church number, the 10 tribes of Israel. The church is spiritual Israel. So it's another clue in the text that Jesus himself is speaking about the church. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins. Virgins. In the Bible, a woman represents the church. A pure woman, Revelation 12, represents the true church, the bride of Christ. A harlot woman, Revelation 17, represents the fallen church. So this parable is a parable that is addressed to the true church. Ten virgins. Virgins represent the church, pure, uncorrupt doctrine. Doctrine that is undefiled by the errors and apostasy and the, and the rituals, and the ceremonies, and the traditions of the enemy. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps. What's the lamp represent in the Bible? Psalm 119, verse 105, thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So here is God's church at end time with the Word of God in its hand, going out to light the way for the coming of the bridegroom. Here is God's church anxiously awaiting something. Last part of verse 1, they went out to meet the bridegroom. So here is an Adventist church. They anticipate the coming of Christ. They believe Jesus is coming. The issue is not doctrinal heresy. 
The issue is not defiled and corrupt doctrines. This parable is relating to God's church at end time who light the way for the coming of the bridegroom and who have pure, true, uncorrupted doctrines. But the Bible says, verse 2, now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Now notice something carefully. Please notice that the story does not contrast the righteous and unrighteous virgins. It does not contrast the holy and the unholy virgins. It does not contrast the good and the bad virgins. It does not contrast the obedient and disobedient virgins. It does not contrast the loyal and rebellious virgins. It does not contrast the pure and the impure virgins. It does not contrast the faithful and the unfaithful virgins. The Bible calls them what, everybody? Wise and foolish. Well, that leads us to another question. If this is a parable of the church, if this is talking about us, and if the Bible talks about the wise and the foolish virgins, what makes the wise wise? What makes the foolish foolish? Were the wise wise because they were awake? They were studying the signs of the times? They, were knew, they knew that we were on the verge of eternity? Why were the wise wise? Why were the foolish foolish? Were the wise wise because they were wide awake and had their eyes open and the foolish were foolish because they were sleeping? The Bible goes on in Matthew chapter 25 and the Bible says in verse 5, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So the reality of the parable, the startling reality of the parable is not that five virgins are sleeping, it is that they all are sleeping, living on the knife edge of eternity, on the verge of the kingdom of God. The true church is pictured as spiritually drowsy and asleep to the great opportunities to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. This is the message of the parable. It is not that five are sleeping, it is that there is a spiritual drowsiness a spiritual stupor that has lulled us all to sleep. The secular, materialistic, godless culture around us affects us as well as the world. God's people are a people with a message, a people with a mission, a people raised up powerfully to share the light of God's truth with mankind in this world of darkness. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 to 3 is a prophecy of these last days of earth's history. Take your Bible, please. God's church is called to light the world with the truths of His Word to prepare a world for the coming of our Lord. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 to 3. Jesus gives a message to His church, a prophetic message at end time. Arise, shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. There will be a revival in God's church at end time. The church will arise. The church will shine. The light of God's truth will radiate from God's people. Arise, shine, for the light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth. Deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you and His glory will be seen upon you. And Gentiles, heathen, pagans shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see they'll gather together, they'll come to you. God is going to move through His church in the last days of earth's history, empowered by the Holy Spirit, filled with the oil of His grace. God's people will illuminate the world with His glory. They will impact the world with His truth. The gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth. The mission will be accomplished. The task will be completed. The work will be finished. The way will be prepared for the bridegroom's return, and Jesus will come. There is no other reason for the existence of the Seventh-day Adventist church than to reveal the light of God's loving glory, His loving character in word and deed to the world, to prepare for the coming of the bridegroom. But the foolish virgins 
fail to participate in the most exciting movement in the history of the world. Why? They miss out on eternity. Why? They're all members of the true church. They're all waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. The foolish as well as the wise accept and believe the truths of Scripture. These foolish virgins are not promoting some kind of doctrinal heresy. They live morally upright lives. They enjoy the fellowship of the wise virgins. What is it about these foolish virgins who come to meetings, dare I say it, dare I not say it, what is it about them? They come to meetings like this. They enjoy the fellowship. They actually participate in witnessing at time. They are doctrinally sound in their thinking. But yet heaven says that they're foolish virgins. The question becomes, what makes a wise virgin wise? And what makes a foolish virgin foolish? And as I reflect on the parable and read it again and again and again, I say, God, could I ever unknowingly, unwittingly be a foolish virgin myself? Matthew 25, verse 3. Matthew 25, verse 3. I want to look at the characteristics of the foolish virgins and then the characteristics of the wise virgins and contrast them and lead us into a deep, heartfelt sense that heaven's oil is flowing into our hearts today. And that if somebody came in here today, a foolish virgin, you can walk out a wise virgin. Somebody walked in today locked in Laodicean spiritual complacency. God's going to touch your heart today. God's going to work in this meeting today. The Spirit is moving in this meeting today. God's going to touch hearts today. There are going to be miracles of God's grace that happen right here today, in this place, in this hour, right now. Matthew, the 28th chapter, 25th chapter. What makes the foolish foolish and what makes the wise wise? Matthew 25, verse 3, we look at it. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now, that's a very interesting passage. When you look at the ancient world, often in ancient weddings, the bride and her bridesmaids would be in a home, and this parable is actually a slice of life out of Palestine. Jesus was sitting there on the Mount of Olives, and he saw a wedding like this taking place, and he used it as an illustration of preparation for his return. The bridegroom would come to the bride's home unexpectedly at night, and the word would go out, the cry would go out, behold, the bridegroom comes, and the bride's maids would light the way before the bride to the bridegroom's home. The wedding feast may last a week, and if you didn't enter in when the feast started, the door would be shut and you couldn't enter in. Now, when you look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 3, it says, those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them it does not say they didn't have oil in their lamps. In the ancient world, oil was placed in the lamp, but a flask of oil was taken along with the lamp, so when the oil in the lamp ran out, the flask of oil would be used to replenish the oil that ran out in the lamp. Now, the fact that the foolish virgins had some oil is significant, and you see that if you let your eyes drop down further in the Bible passage, 
Matthew chapter 25, follow as I read verses 5 and onward. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So the wise and the foolish, verse 7, trimmed their lamps. What does that mean? They lit their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. So what does that indicate? The foolish virgins had some oil, but they did not have a sufficient supply of oil because the delay was so long that the small amount of oil that they had was not sufficient to take them on the journey from the bride's home to the bridegroom's home, and their lamps were going out. Now, they lacked this indispensable oil. In the Bible, what is oil a symbol of? What's that a symbol of? But wait, you say it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit, but what, aren't there many symbols of the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Why didn't they have a candle of fire? Wind is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Why does God take the symbolism of oil and use this as the illustration of what the foolish virgins did not have? Here's why. If you look throughout the Old Testament, oil is associated with three things. Number one, the sanctuary. The, when the sanctuary was inaugurated, the priests were anointed with oil. When the sanctuary was inaugurated, the sacred vessels were anointed with oil. Oil represents consecration, the setting apart. Oil represents total commitment to the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit impresses the heart and mind through the oil of God's grace that flows from the sanctuary to lead men and women to make an unreserved, total, absolute commitment to the kingdom. So oil is always consecration. Secondly, throughout the Bible, oil is always healing. You remember in the New Testament, the good Samaritan found the bruised, broken, bloody traveler, and he anointed that traveler with what? Oil. Oil symbolizes healing. God will have an end-time people whose minds and eyes and ears and hearts and inner beings are totally, absolutely consecrated to Him. They seek first the kingdom of God. They want Jesus. They put Jesus first. Seek you first the kingdom of God. That is the priority and passion of their lives. And the oil of the Spirit that leads them to this deepening consecration heals their hearts of anger, resentment, bitterness, jealousy, rivalry between ministries, lust, gossip. So there is an end-time preparation of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit comes upon God's praying, seeking church, and men and women are set aside so they long for the kingdom of God, they hunger for eternity, and they are cleansed within or healed within through the ministry of the Holy Spirit about the, regarding those attitudes that keep the latter reign of God's power from falling. What is the oil representative of? First, consecration, second, healing, and third, illumination illumination. Oil provides the basis for the lamps. God will have an end-time people consecrated to Him, healed within of inner attitudes that keep them from being the powerful witnesses that God wants to the world, who hold the torch of truth high to light the way for the coming of the bridegroom. God longs to have a group of people filled with His Spirit, consecrated to Him, healed of bitterness, envy, jealousy, competition, healed of pride, arrogance, self-inflated importance, a people who are not so interested in talking about what they do, but talking about what Jesus does, a people who witness to His grace, who are consumed with holding a lighted torch of truth to get ready for the coming of Jesus. Now, there are three fatal mistakes of the false virgins, of the foolish virgins. Here they are, three fatal mistakes. One, they had some oil, but not enough. 
they thought the limited supply of oil they had was sufficient enough. When the cry came, behold, the bridegroom comes, they cried out, our lamps are going out, we do not have enough. Their supply of oil was not sufficient for the unanticipated delay. Is it possible to assume that a superficial experience with God will get us through the great crisis ahead? Have we forgotten the words of the prophet, we will need an experience much broader or deeper than we possibly can imagine? The foolish virgins were part of the superficial conservative class. Are you depending on an experience with Jesus that you once had? Is your spiritual lamp going out? Are you depending on an experience with God that is in the past tense and not the present? Does your heart still burn within you when you open God's Word? Is the most exciting, precious time of your day the time you open God's Word and spend more time with Him? How is your devotional life? Do you know Jesus? And does Jesus live in your soul and move in your life? Do you still sense Jesus' presence when you get on your knees to pray? Or has your prayer life become boring and ritualistic and something you hurry through as a ceremony? Do you still love to take those long walks alone, listen to the singing of the birds, see the magnificence of the flowers, and say, thank you, Jesus, for nature, and just let him transform your life. You see, the foolish virgins put their trust in the wrong place. The foolish virgins trusted that their past experience that they once had would be sufficient to take them to the wedding feast. The height of Christian folly is neglecting personal soul culture and believing that everything is all right because I believe the right thing and because I'm a witness for Jesus. The foolish virgins were superficial and conservative, but the foolish virgins lacked something deep inside. Ellen White talks about this group in Christ's Object Lessons, page 411. She says, the class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. When I read the next sentence, I spent significant time meditating on it, applying it to my own life. They have a regard for the truth. The foolish virgins have a regard for truth. They have advocated the truth. So these are not fanatical heretics. They have a regard for the truth. They've advocated the truth. The foolish virgins have advocated the truth. They're involved in witnessing. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. So look at these three things that inspiration says about the foolish virgins. They've got a regard for the truth, they advocate the truth, they're attracted to those that believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock Christ Jesus and permitted their old nature to be broken up. Here is the issue. Although they believe the truth and witness, the old nature deep within their hearts is still dominant. It says, the Spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent in planting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with the superficial work. And I fall upon my knees and I say, God, help me not be content with the superficial work in my life. They do not know God. See, this is the issue with the foolish virgins. The oil of the Holy Spirit flowing from heaven's sanctuary and the function of the Holy Spirit is to witness of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit's function has been neglected in their life. They have not been healed deep within. They believe truth. They accept truth. They may witness for the truth, but often they're prompted and motivated by the old nature rather than the new nature. And it says they do not know God. They've not studied His character. They've not held communion with Him. 
Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Their service to God degenerates into a form. The foolish virgins are, are content with a stale, superficial experience from the past, although they acknowledge the truth. The truth has not transformed their lives. The old nature dominates their thoughts and actions. On the outward appearance, everything looks fine. They have lamps in their hands. What more did they need? They thought they were ready for the coming of the bridegroom. But there is a difference, brothers and sisters, between having the Word of God in your hand to defend the truth and having the Word in your heart to live the truth. The foolish virgins were informed but not transformed. They were instructed by the Word but not changed through the Word. They were convicted of the truth but not changed by the truth. Here's the essential question. Has the truth which you believe, the truth which you share with others, has that radically impacted and transformed your life so you're a different man, a different woman? In the parable of the ten virgins, the ten virgins do not understand fully what genuine conversion is all about. The oil represents the sanctifying grace of the Holy Spirit that transforms our character and enables us to be more like Jesus. Now, here is the incredible good news. There is an abundant supply of heaven's oil for you and for me. There is no shortage of the power of the Holy Spirit to give us the victories that we long for in our own personal lives. Nobody else's prayers, though, can substitute for yours. Nobody else can study God's Word for you. Nobody else can have an intimate relationship with God for you. In the bridegroom's absence, there is a tendency to slumber. The greatest challenge that the Seventh-day Adventist Church faces today is this. We are a church that should not be here. We have never been in it for the marathon. We've always been in it for the sprint. But the church since 1844 has gone on. It's gone on for 160 years five years, 166 years. And the longer the time goes on, the more the spiritual drowsiness and slumber increases. And the beauty is this. God is moving among His people today to bring a spiritual renewal and a spiritual revival through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will bring to this people a mighty spiritual revival and usher in the coming of Jesus. But that does lead us to a question that we should not neglect this morning. And the question is implied in Matthew chapter 25. I want you to notice it, please. Matthew chapter 25, and you'll notice it there, verse 5. But while the bridegroom was, and what is the word in verse 5? Delayed, they all slumbered and slept. There is a delay in the coming of the bridegroom. If the Seventh-day Adventist church answered one question, it probably is the most vital question that the church could answer, and it's this. Why is it that the second coming of Christ is delayed? Why didn't Jesus come in 1885? Or why didn't He come in 1850? Why didn't He come in 1910, 1930? The answer to that question is not a single one-sentence answer. If you carefully study Scripture and the writings of Ellen White, there are at least three reasons why Jesus delays His coming. Let's briefly look at each of them. First, reason one. Why does Jesus delay His coming? Reason one. Christ waits in love, suffering Himself 
over the pain, agony, sorrow, poverty, sickness, and death of our world, waiting for the gospel to be preached with all power so all humanity will have an opportunity to be saved. The evidence of that is found in Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Why does the Bible say in Matthew chapter 25 that we read that Jesus delays His coming? He waits in love. He longs for all humanity to be saved. He longs for all men and women everywhere to hear the gospel. He does not want one person to be lost. Take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. We look there in the book of Peter. And the Lord is very clear in 2 Peter chapter 3. Let your eyes drop down to verse 9. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it's actually verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but He is long-suffering toward us. God is not slack concerning His promise. Has He promised to come? Will He come? The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Why hasn't Jesus come? Because He waits in love. He waits longing that all men and women everywhere will accept His love. He will not come until the gospel goes to the ends of the earth. Can the church hasten the coming of Jesus? Desire of Ages, page 633. Had the church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would before this have been warned, and the Lord Jesus would have come to earth in power and glory. Desire of Ages 633 continuing, by giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. I don't know how the language could be clearer. God is looking for a people that are passionate about sharing His love with the world, passionate about sharing the light of truth with His world, a people that are consecrated by the oil of His grace, who are healed in their hearts of anger, bitterness, and jealousy, who focus on one thing, and that is getting a world ready for the coming of Jesus. Why doesn't Jesus come? One, the gospel hasn't been preached to the world. Reason two, Christ waits for His church to reveal His incredible character of love to a waiting world and a watching universe. You see, the cross is the answer to the great controversy. Jesus' death on the cross answers Satan's charges and reveals that God is love. God now longs for a community of grace, His body, His church, to reveal that His way brings joy and happiness, and Satan's way of selfishness brings death. What is God waiting for? Not only to be gospel to be preached out there, but He's waiting for something to happen in His church. The Bible says, when the harvest is fully ripe. And Revelation 14 talks about two harvests, the harvest of golden grain and the harvest of gory grapes. The harvest of golden grain is the character of Jesus that He longs to reveal through His Holy Spirit to transform our lives so we become the loving people that are lights in this world, in a world of hate and selfishness. That is why Ellen White puts it so clearly in Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of Himself in His church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in His people, then He will come to claim them as His own. What is Jesus waiting for? First, the gospel to go to the world. Secondly, the gospel to penetrate our hearts so deeply that we reveal His love to a waiting world in the watching universe. But there is a third factor, and it's this. Not only will there be the proclamation of the gospel, not only will there be the harvest of golden grain, there will be the harvest of gory grapes. There will be a manifestation in this world of the wickedness and rebellion and selfishness of sin that brings devastation and destruction to the world. Although the church can hasten the coming of Jesus, the church cannot delay the coming of Jesus indefinitely. Christ waits 
not only for a full, complete demonstration of His love to be revealed through His people, but also He must let wickedness, evil, sin run its course. So the whole universe will see the ultimate results of Satan's rebellion and be secure forever. Now listen to these powerful statements. Prophets and Kings 417, there is a limit beyond which the judgments of Jehovah can no longer be delayed. There is a limit beyond which the judgments of Jehovah can no longer be delayed. God keeps a fifth volume of the testimonies, 524, God keeps a reckoning with the nations. When the time fully comes that iniquity shall have reached the stated boundary of God's mercy, His forbearance will cease. When the accumulated figures in heaven's record books shall mark the sum of transgression complete, wrath will come. There will be a convergence, and I believe that convergence is taking place now. There will be convergence of a praying people whose hearts are passionate about preaching the gospel to the world, who are asking God to cleanse their hearts in unusual ways so that they can be everything that God wants them to be. And at that same time that God is leading His church into a revival, into a commitment to reaching the world with the gospel, with people praying and hearts broken and people on their knees, as that is taking place, Satan sees what's taking place in the church and he redoubles his efforts of wickedness in the world and transgression le reaches its limit. And God says, this is enough. This is enough. And the greatest danger that the foolish virgins face and that we face is putting off a decision to let God deal with our hearts as He wants to, which is of enormous consequences. What happened to the foolish virgins? Spiritual complacency paralyzed them. They were locked in self-congratulation telling how great they were. They were bathed in self-confidence. They were satisfied with what they had. They never dreamed that they'd be unprepared for the coming of the bridegroom. They failed to understand their lack some time ago. I read a story about, and of course it's a fictitious story, about Satan, and he had a council meeting, a strategy meeting in heaven. And in that strategy meeting, he called the angels and he said, now, now tell me what is your strategy to deceive God's people? One angel says, one evil angel says, my strategy is to tell them there is no God. The devil says in this imaginary story, don't be so foolish. The evidence of nature, the Bible, prophecy, people know there is no God. They know there's a God. They'll never accept that there is no God. Second angel says, well, tell them that there is no truth. The devil says, look, in science there's truth. You may fool some people at that, but you're not going to fool all the people. Third angel says, well, tell them that there is no hurry. Tell them there is no hurry. Tell them that they've got plenty of time. Tell them that there is no urgency. Tell them to put off personal preparation. Tell them to wait till a more convenient time to deal with their attitudes. Tell them, tell them that they don't need now to be on their knees seeking God for broken hearts. Is God calling you to something deeper than you can imagine? Have you been putting off a deeper experience with God in your own life? Do you sense the Spirit moving in your own personal heart to a deeper Bible study life, a deeper prayer life? The only way to get ready for the coming of Christ is to get ready today and stay ready. Is there anything lurking in the shadows of your heart that you may not be aware of? Are you willing to say today, Lord, I want to surrender any habit, any attitude that's a barrier between me and anybody else? I want to send, uh, surrender any habit in my life that's not in harmony with your will. Lord, I want you to do a work in me so I can hold the torch of truth high. Lord, I long for the oil of your grace to flow into my heart and life. I love that old song as something about these old hymns. 
written out of the context of experience. Amen. Number 260, hover over me, Holy Spirit. Bathe my trembling heart and brow. Fill me with your hallowed presence. Come, oh, come and fill me now. Fill me now, fill me now. Jesus, come and fill me now. Fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, oh, come and fill me now. I love the third verse. I am weakness, full of weakness. At thy sacred feet I bow. Bless divine, eternal spirit. Fill with love and fill me now. Fill me now, oh, fill me now. Jesus, come and fill me now. Look to the screen. Just as we're seated, let's sing that first verse together. Hover over me, Holy Spirit. Does God want to do something in your life right now? Has your devotional life been weak and stale? Has your prayer life become ritualistic and formal? Is there some habit in your life that would keep you from being ready from the, for the coming of Jesus? Is there some attitude in you that's going to keep your ministry from being as successful as God wants it to be because of that attitude? Let Jesus break that now. Let Jesus crush that now. Let the, let, the, let the Messiah crush the serpent's head in your life. Now let Jesus right now do something in your life. Let's sing it together. Hover me over, hover over me, Holy Spirit. Recently, I have been studying the book of Acts, and as I've read through Acts and sensed the power of the Holy Spirit poured out on the disciples in the day of Pentecost, it has radically transformed my own life. As I studied these disciples coming together in small groups to pray, as I observed in the text of Scripture, they're boldly, confidently proclaiming the Word of God. As I sensed in the book of Acts that thousands were coming to Christ and being baptized, that new churches were being planted, that new continents were being reached for God, I was so profoundly moved by that that I began to write. And the result of that study of the book of Acts is a new book called Revive Us Again. Every chapter is saturated with Bible and statements from the writings of Ellen White, the pen of inspiration. The first chapter in the book deals with prayer and revival. It talks about how to have a meaningful prayer life, how Jesus wants to speak to your heart, how he wants to have an intimate relationship with you. The book goes on to discuss the urgency of revival, the need for revival in our individual lives now the priority of revival. We talk about the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins and why the wise were wise and why the foolish were foolish and the urgent appeal that God gives us at end time to be sure that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the most powerful chapters in the entire book is the promised revival, the promise that God is going to pour out his spirit at end time. There's a chapter on revivals true and false, counterfeit revivals. How do you tell the difference between a true revival and a counterfeit revival? What will counterfeit revivals look like and what will true revivals look like? Every chapter in the book has an application page where you can personally go into that application page. Pastors are using this book for prayer meetings and they're taking their members through it. Members have small groups in their home that are meeting, studying this book. I would encourage you to use Revive Us Again 
as a resource for your church, for your personal life, for your small group as you read it. You will be incredibly blessed. Revive Us Again is a book that will lead you into a deeper experience with our Lord and prepare you for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at end time.